everyone, welcome to Media 7. We're back in front of a live audience at Auckland's Classic Comedy Club. We explore two very different topics this week, albeit two that have a lot of angry voices on the internet in common. Later in the show, we'll look at the controversial copyright law that requires ISPs to cut off customers accused of copyright infringement. But for now, it's off to Fiji, where the media do not have an easy time. Here's some news you may have missed. Fiji's present leaders do not get a good press in New Zealand. They are frequently depicted as incompetent at best and self-serving and thuggish at worst. But not everyone agrees. New Zealand geographer Crosby Walsh, who spent eight years at the University of the South Pacific in Suva, launched a blog to oppose what he calls defective mainstream media coverage of Fiji. His particular beef, a Radio New Zealand interview last year with Fairfax journalist Michael Field, which was the subject of a partially successful Broadcasting Standards Authority complaint from Fiji's Solicitor General, Christopher Pride. Pride slated Field for relying on so-called second-hand sources, such as blogs, in discussing Fiji's courts and the summary deportation of Fiji Sun publisher Russell Hunter, rather than reporting first-hand. Our Fijian journalistic colleagues and all the media have to live with the, the madness that is modern Fiji at the moment. His complaint didn't note that the last time Field tried to report first-hand from Fiji, he was arrested and detained, then deported. He remains on a blacklist for criticising the regime. At the Fiji Times, not one but two troublesome publishers have been deported lately. Last year, Evan Hanna was thrown out. This year, it's his successor, Rex Gardner. No reason was given for my deportation. I probably won't get one either, because that's the way they operate, you know, the dark of night, this sort of thing. So, can reasonable people disagree on the true intentions of 2006 coup leader Frank Barney Marama? Is press freedom dead in Fiji? Are the governments and news media of New Zealand and Australia patronising Fijians? And should we have heard more about John Key telling Fiji's Attorney General that he should be on trial? Like everything about Fiji's political history in the past 20 years, it's complicated. Joining us to make sense of it all are AUT's Dr David Roby, whose Cafe Pacific blog is an essential source of news and commentary on Pacific media and politics. TVNZ's Pacific correspondent Barbara Drever, another journalist who have been detained and shipped out by Fiji's interim government. And Robert Kahn, director of the Auckland station Radio Tirana, which provides a key point of contact for the city's Indo-Fijian community. Welcome to you all. Thanks for joining us. David, um, did I just say complicated just now? I think I meant incredibly complicated. It is, isn't it? It's extraordinarily uh, complex uh, in uh, Fiji. Uh, and uh, when you think of the regime, is actually in the last year had it's a pretty good uh, uh, tally, if you like. Uh, that they've got rid of uh, three uh, so called uh, troublesome uh, publishers and uh, two diplomats. Uh, but it all stems back from uh, 1987 with the uh, first two uh, coups that uh, Sotavani Sotavan Rambuka actually staged. Um, and three out of the four coups were all about uh, ethno-nationalism. The fourth coup uh, ostensibly is aiming uh, for some kind of uh, new vision uh, with a uh, multi-ethnic uh, nation and uh, changes to uh, the, essentially the, the whole electoral system and changes uh, addressing poverty and, and so on. That's the dream, that's the vision. Uh, that uh, Bainu has, uh, has, has come up with. So there's quite a contrast to the previous uh, coups. But in, es in essence, this coup happened because of the, all the unsolved problems from the uh, three uh, previous uh, coups, uh, particularly the uh, one in 2000 with uh, George uh, Spate. Um, and that was a fundamentalist ethno-nationalist um, uh, coup. And in essence, the uh, uh, democratic government uh, that was ousted by Bainu Marama uh, was the um, uh, acceptable, if you like, within the region public face of this fundamentalism. Do you think our, uh, the news media in New Zealand have done a good enough job of scrutinising our own government's actions in, in this affair? Not at all. Uh, most of, uh, most um, and with exceptions of uh, people like uh, Barbara and, uh, and, and a number of other uh, journalists, uh, Mike uh, Field, so, but, but many journalists have actually sort of portrayed very much what the uh, uh, Australian and, uh, and New Zealand uh, um, political objectives are in the, the region. And not enough has actually uh, been put into reporting the complexities and why. Uh, this coup has happened and why we have a coup culture and why fundamental changes actually have to happen in Fiji. 
But it might also be said that, that the interim government doesn't do itself any favours by the way it treats journalists. I mean, Barbara, you're an, as I noted in that setup, you're another journalist who's been kicked out and banned. Do you have any idea why that happened? Yes, it was a story I did on a poverty-stricken town, Batukola, which is, is, and we went there and we spent the day with the people there and told their story, and the interim government did not like that. Um, apparently, there's some trust fund that they haven't paid up to help those people yet, which is part of the problem. But, yeah, I mean, how, how do we get these, you know, we, we want to talk to these people. Quite often, we'll go, when I've been in Fiji, we'll ask for people in that military-led government to speak, and they just won't. I mean, it's really that simple. So how does being banned affect, A, your, your, your professional work and also your personal life? I mean, you're from Kiribati, aren't you? Well, that's right. I mean, the Kiribati president has said that, told me that they'll fight to try and get me back on. Um, Personally, I've been and it's interesting that he's likely to have uh, more sway than, than John Well, he's Keir. a friend. That's right. Kiribati and Tuvalu are considered friends of Fiji. At least they were until that, that last forum meet last week. So, um, but they are considered friendly and they do support Fiji because they rely on Fiji so much. So if anyone has sway, it will be him. And also the Cook Islands has offered to step in as well. But who knows? So personally, um, I was, uh, I'm upset because I've been going to, to Fiji since I was a little girl. But... From a professional point of view, well, you know, I can still get the story done. We still pick up the phone and make our, do our interviews over the phone. There's no problems getting footage out of Fiji. But, uh, you know, there's nothing like being there. Mm. Now, Robert, um, at, at Tarama, you're in quite a different position to Barbara in that you seem to be able to get Commodore Baini Marama when you want to speak to him. Why, why is that? Well, you should ask him that, but he has never turned, turned, turned around and said, I'm not going to give you an interview. And I think it's, it's also got to do with the point what David was mentioning. We seem to understand the Fiji situation. We come from the ground level up, and Fiji is, a very complex, Fiji is very complex in its politics. It's not like New Zealand where it's all about, at, all at national level. There's all different structures, different stakeholders, chiefly systems. We understand all that. And when we're talking to people from Fiji, they understand that we understand, so in a, they're quite comfortable with us. So we get those exclusives. And yet I've also heard it said by people we talked to when we were researching the show that, that you get them because you are very, very pro-interim government. Is that true? Not at all. We're very neutral in how we look at um, uh, all parties. I mean, we're, at the end of the day, we're a media organisation. Just because we get these interviews and others don't, that's no reason to label us as pro-interim government. Just for your record, Lassini and Garasa gives us equal amount of time as what Bani Marama does, but unfortunately nobody wants to listen. Nobody, nobody puts it on their newspaper or on their television what Garasi has to say. They all talk about what Bani Marama has to say because that's considered good news. Would Bani Marama Marama help his case if he did talk to people like Barbara more, you know, more readily? It, it seems that, that it's the fact they won't talk. Yeah. Right. Well, <laughs> well, in all fairness, you've got to realise, I, I think that um, there's, there's very few journalists in New Zealand that can say that they understand the, the plight of Fiji as such. And I think Barbara is one of them. And I've, I, for one, um, do not agree with the fact that she's not allowed back into Fiji for whatever reason they're stating because at the end of the day she's doing her job and she does that well. She's one of the few ones that understand by barring her who, do, who else do you get? Who well, do, who what else about, do you say, have? Michael Field, who was a, a very strong critic of the interim government? Is that a different case? Do you think that was in any way justified? I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not too much aware of the Michael Field case because I didn't follow that uh, too strongly. I know, of course, at the end of the day, any journalist getting banned, I mean, I'm going to stand on the, on the, on the side of uh, freedom of speech and also in terms of what these people stand for. They don't go out there doing, to, do, to do bad stories on them. They go out there to do their job. So, I, at the end of the day, Michael Field deserves a fair hearing as well. Now, Dave, I get, I get the impression, from, you know, particularly from reading your blog, you know, Cafe Pacific, that although there's concern over press freedom, there's, you've also hinted at a degree of journalistic irresponsibility in the media environment there. Is that the case? Well, I think, I think yes, that's a fair uh, criticism to a degree. I mean, that, uh, th you know, there's extraordinarily good journalism done in Fiji by a number of uh, journalists. But the problem is, is that when you're faced with a coup culture like um, uh, Fiji's faced for the last 20 years, so many uh, really good uh, and experienced uh, journalists have left the country over a period of time. And so there's been a constant, because uh, when, when I was actually in Fiji at the time of the George Spate coup, and we had, uh, I was at the journalism school there, and we had uh, students involved in covering uh, that coup. Um, and one of the extraordinary things you would think, well, well you know, uh, that'd be the most experienced journalists uh, in the Pacific dealing with reporting on coups. Uh, in Fiji, it wasn't the case because, in, in fact, 
fact, many, many of the uh, middle order experienced uh, journalists had left since 1987. So well, it's then, like well, a learning experience these, all well, over again. Were these expats or, or native born uh, no, no, Fiji, Fiji uh, journalists? Right. Um, uh, you get the impression that because uh, Fiji Times and so on, uh, uh, you know, it's a News Corp uh, owned and uh, Australian expatriate published and that sort of thing, the journalists, the fan and file journalists, uh, they're, they're Fiji journalists and many, many are quite talented. But when you, when you have the vast majority of uh, uh, journalists that are quite young, I remember doing uh, research and uh, there's actually a report that's done in uh, 2004 which uh, showed that 49% uh, of journalists in Fiji actually did not have uh, any kind of real training. If you compare that with say New Zealand where journalists have to have uh, essentially a diploma or degree before they even get on the ground floor in a newsroom. Uh, in Fiji, uh, most uh, journalists are school leavers uh, and the complexity of the political system uh, and, and uh, high school doesn't really prepare most journalists unless you're absolutely really gifted and you ride through all this anyway. Well then on but the other hand you had that ex extraordinary recommendation from the, the Fiji Human Rights Commission um, which recommended that, uh, you know, that non-Fijian journalists should not be allowed to work in Fiji. But where did that come from? Well, it's been a long uh, history of, I, I think, resentment uh, in, in some quarters in Fiji uh, because it's easy to blame uh, the media, it's easy to blame the expatriate uh, publishers and so on. But if you compare it, say, with uh, Papua New Guinea, for example, where uh, the main newspaper is also owned uh, by Murdoch's uh, uh, News, News Corp, um, you know, they, they had uh, indigenous uh, Papua New Guinean um, um, editor way back in uh, 1969, I think it was, uh, and they've always had uh, indigenous editors ever, ever since, and uh, many, many on the board of directors are also Papua New Guinean. And so there's always been a bit of a contrast with Fiji, because uh, Fiji is used as sort of like a training ground for its, uh, you know, emerging sort of uh, publishers and uh, executives. They, so they make a success of Fiji, make a good profit, and then off to well, another... It's, it's mm. very lively. I mean, a lot of the journos up there went to train last year, um, some of them, but they have to work incredibly hard just to get even basic information now. And so their role is so much more important than what it ever was before. People rely on them. And what's happening now is that um, I talked to a journalist last week, a Fijian journalist. Now, they have, that journalist has stopped working for an international organisation that he's to string for because he says it's, it's just not worth his safety. That's what it's got down to. I mean, they still work hard in Fiji and they still do the stories, but there's so much pressure on them now. And I wonder if, as a consequence of that, you've seen it go underground, because I've been looking at the, the Fijian side, the blogs at the respective sides. Um, we thought the blogosphere was vicious here. It's, it's extraordinary. Oh, it's, um, it's, it, it's a pitched battle out there. It has the debate that maybe could have been going on in the mainstream media It doesn't media matter what Fiji. side of the fence you sit on, it's pretty vicious. It really is. You must, you must, have look, you must look at this differently as well. There are certain media organisations in Fiji who, uh, who have political affiliations, full stop. And that includes television, newspaper, radio. They have political affiliation, either side of the fence, right? But by having that affiliation, you are definitely going to get two sides. And that's why I think when you look at what Barbara is saying, that certain journalists are coming out of the, um, the professions they don't want to be in anymore, it's probably because of the others. Because because of a, f a set few, everybody gets to be in the same, uh, same situation. So I, you must, I think you've got to understand about how media works in Fiji and what the current media is doing to the interim government and how, how they, how some How have been doing to the interim government? Well, you mean they're, they're, they're being hostile? There's, there's this continuous um, issue of, uh, of being against the, gov the interim government and the interim government feels nobody listens to them. That's, that's, if you talk to them, they'll say, and oh, nobody listens. Them to talk. They, 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 <laughs> nobody listens to them. Exactly. Yeah. There's the irony TV. of the whole thing. Yeah. yeah. The Fiji TV, for example. What do you think? What, what, what's happening with Fiji TV? What's your, what's your perception? They work so hard to try and get those people to comment. I mean, sometimes, and you know, they, they've received all sorts of threats and, uh, you know, home on their home phones and, and all sorts of things. This is the environment they have to work on. I think they do their best. But what's happening is because they, in a way, generate that fear, is when they go to a court sitting, for example, they will report it word for word for word. So right. the public can't actually understand what's on that piece because they're, they're so scared about getting it wrong that they make it incredibly complicated. So that's another problem that they're facing. I want to come, uh, pick up the point that you made before about the, um, the, the blogs, you know, because uh, in fact, most, uh, quite a few of those blogs are actually done by journalists. 
uh, and it sort of become, a, particularly last year, it became uh, it's a something of a safety style and, for the pros. Uh, yeah. and, and then you get this irony that to have even got the the regime or the interim uh, government, the IG blog that's been set up by by a journalist uh, in, in, in the name of uh, the regime and so on, and it, and it gets incredibly um, vitriolic. Uh, and there have been reprisals. Uh, I remember at one point the uh, USB Journalism School uh, had, uh, had you know, sort of a kickback uh, because uh, they were believed to be connected with one of the blocks. Untrue, actually, but, uh, you know, there's that climate mm -hmm. of um, yeah. repression. So, yeah. That, yeah. so that journalists feel that in some ways, well, they, they've got their, their very public uh, media exposure, but, but the blogs sometimes actually can, they can, they can get a story out on the media. Uh, we'll we'll, we'll the pick up that point about the media climate. Um, we have to take a break now, um, but we will be back in a minute with more Pacific complexity.